In hurricane force winds, they leap into raging ocean waters to pull sailors from the jaws of death. He thinks the captain went down with the boat. Oh, he said it went right down. When lands are flooded to rooftops, they risk their lives to hoist stranded survivors to safety. Trevor and survivor are clear of the water at this time. And when emergency medical treatment is hours away, they are called to make it a matter of minutes. All positions, bathrooms outside the cabin door. Rescue swimmers, next on Dangerous Missions. Viewers of television news broadcasts have most likely seen the work of rescue swimmers in dramatic situations without realizing who they are. Whenever weather conditions turn oceans and rivers into potential graveyards, the rescue swimmers of the U.S. Coast Guard and Navy are asked to perform what many consider physically, emotionally, and mentally impossible. In waters cold enough to kill from hypothermia within minutes, they sometimes spend hours, never leaving a scene until every potential survivor is rescued. These guys are certifiably nuts. You know, in the middle of a hurricane, at night, or any, in any conditions, 60-foot seas, they're, they're chomping at the bit to, to go do their job. And you just kind of scratch your head and go, what makes these guys tick? But they're, they're true heroes. When Navy tragedies occur, it is the Navy rescue swimmers who not only must pull an injured pilot from the sea, but administer critical first aid, both in the water and in the helicopter. When victims are civilians, the Coast Guard gets the first call to perform rescues that are frequently as dangerous to the swimmers as to the survivors. It's not just flying lifeguards, they're the ones that fix the pumps. They're the ones that do the first aid. They're the ones that do the triage. They're the ones that keep their heart beating until we get them to the hospital. These guys are top notch. They're second to none. Swimmers away. Swimmer is in the water. Rescue swimmers are the point men and women of highly trained teams. Swimmers are successful only when their helicopter pilots and flight mechanics are doing their jobs. Insight, she's commands. Roger. Often requiring a chopper to keep a perfectly steady hover in gale force winds. Hold, Hold position. Swimmers are clear of the water. The pilots, uh, you know, in the right seat is doing most of the, uh, the flying. Uh, the co-pilots are uh, doing uh, some of the flying and all the communicating and the navigating. Uh, the flight mechanic, of course, running the uh, hoist, actually lowering down the rescue swimmer. And of course, the rescue swimmer is the one that we actually lower down into harm's way to actually pluck the people out of the water. The training for Coast Guard and Navy swimmer rescue teams is relentless. Day after day, when the crews are not on active missions, they rehearse every emergency situation imaginable. So when a real crisis comes, the teams operate like well-oiled machines, each person knowing his own job and the needs of his partners. Everyone involved has to be physically and mentally ready to do this job 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, at a second's notice because it never happens when everything's perfect. Fifty years ago, there was no military job classification of rescue swimmer. During World War II, pilots downed in the sea were rescued in several different ways, none of which involved helicopters or specially trained swimmers. Most water rescues were conducted from pontoon-equipped float planes, which landed on the water's surface. It was up to the downed airman to make his way to the aircraft. But if the pilot had been injured and did not have the physical ability to reach the plane, someone, usually a member of the flight crew, had to go get him. As such rescue techniques were not rehearsed, crewmen were not equipped with wetsuits or even swim trunks. 
Some preferred to make their rescues in the buff, rather than face long flights home in soaking wet uniforms. When float planes were not available for air-sea rescues, dirigibles were used. Life rafts and sailors were lowered a long way down to pull pilots out of the sea. When helicopters were first used for water rescues in Vietnam, they were also equipped with pontoons and landed on the water surface. Still, however, no specially trained swimmers were part of the chopper crew. These aircraft were primarily designed as warships, not rescue vessels. When a victim could not make it to the chopper without help, a gunner or other crew member stripped off his camouflage shirt and headed into the water. During the later years of Vietnam, it became obvious there was a need for highly trained military specialists to perform difficult water rescues. As we evolved into the Vietnam War, that necessity came to the forefront because we were doing much more launch and recoveries and, and aircraft fully loaded with uh, munitions. We developed into a point where rescue swimmers were on a plane guard pattern around a ship during every launch and recovery cycle, readily available should an aircraft hit the water during a launch or recovery, those people would be right there ready to try to make a rescue. Jerry Harp, now a civilian helicopter pilot training military personnel, was one of the first Navy rescue swimmers. They were looking at a person day or night to go out there and was not afraid to go in three o'clock in the morning, 3 a.m. for a down pilot in the water and get him out of the water. Uh, are you scared? Absolutely but can you control your fear? That's what they're looking for. Following the Navy's lead, the U.S. Coast Guard developed its own rescue swimmer program. First trained alongside Navy swimmers in Pensacola, Florida, Coast Guard swimmers are now taught at their own facility in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. The addition of rescue swimmers to the life-saving arsenals of the U.S. Coast Guard and Navy has saved countless lives, but not without tragic losses. Since the start of rescue swimmer specialization, three Coast Guard swimmers have lost their lives in helicopter crashes en route to rescues. One Navy rescue swimmer was killed during a rescue attempt. Nevertheless, there are long waiting lists for Coast Guard and Navy personnel who want to be trained as rescue swimmers. Trainees in both programs undergo some of the most grueling endurance tests of mind and body that any branch of the armed services can deliver. It's 10 p.m. on a brisk December night in Pensacola, Florida. In near total darkness, an infrared night shot video camera reveals rescue swimmers using only chemical light sticks for illumination, assessing the injuries of a downed pilot, disentangling him from the shroud lines of his parachute, and safely hoisting him into a hovering rescue chopper. But the rotor wash of cascading water is not being caused by a helicopter. It is artificially produced by the nozzle of a fire hose fixed on a hoist tower at the end of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. This evening's training exercise at the Naval Aviation RSS Rescue Swimmer School is called Night Ops. And what we're doing is we're teaching these kids uh, nighttime familiarization, showing them that they don't necessarily need their eyes to form rescues in the water. Night Ops is part of an intense four-week Navy program designed to prepare rescue swimmers for the worst conditions they can encounter. S-A-R! Rescue Swimmers! Every two weeks, a new class of 24 begins the Navy Rescue Swimmer Program. Although some will come from other Navy positions, most arrive at the age of 18 or 19, right out of high school. Swimmers! S! Their pipeline training is going to start out in boot camp 
Then they're gonna go over to four weeks of training at air crew school. At that point in time, they'll come to uh, rescue swimmer school. So we're gonna have some of the raw talent that's out there in today's society, and we have to mold the, those people into rescue swimmers. So at the end of that training cycle, those people are ready to go out and save the pilots' lives. Are you ready? On average, out of each class of 24, only 16 will graduate. Some will quit voluntarily due to lack of will. Others will be asked to leave due to a lack of strength, revealed during grueling physical training, or PT. On the, on the physical side of it, they have to have the, uh, the stamina to, to uh, be able to perform multiple rescues. And, and we develop that stamina uh, through a, a running program, as well as an upper body conditioning program, push-ups, pull-ups, things of that nature, to target uh, the upper body to be able to latch onto a, a person they're rescuing and physically drag them back towards the helicopter. We absolutely need leg strength to be able to continuously swim with fins on. If you are and you want to be here, you better start keeping in step with everybody else. Do you understand? The first week, you get yelled at constantly. You know, they're screaming in your ears. They, they PT you, tell you just, tell you can't do it no more, really, you know. And um, at first, you wonder why, and then you start to realize it's just motivation. You know, you, you start to feed off it after a while. Are you ready? Petty Officer Second Class Heather Lingo, an instructor at the school, became the Navy's first female rescue swimmer in 1992. The first week is usually the breaking point for most people. I'd say it's all mental. You have to have it physically, but the people that are strong-willed and strong-minded are the ones that prevail through the school. You better be signing off or these are gonna be real painful. I'd never done any of this stuff before. I joined the military because I was strong-willed and motivated about what I was doing, then that kind of helped me through. <coughs> First group, mount, bar. Up, up, up. You gotta get your chins up over the bar. It's motivating to have another female there to, to see that, she, you know, someone else made it through too. I don't take offense to her yelling at me or anything like that. You have to want this to do it. I mean, you really have to want it because if you don't want it, you're not gonna get through this four weeks at all. I never thought even once about quitting, but I did wonder a couple times, you know, when they'd wake us up in the morning to PT in, and then beach running was, you know, pretty tough on me. If there was one reason to quit, it would have been them beach runs. We will do it again. Go! Physical endurance tests in the water are even more important than those on land. Rescue swimmer recruits swim lap after lap to develop the stamina to rescue survivor after survivor. find some students that have specific problems with swimming. You know, it seems amazing, but they've come into the Navy and thought this would be a great job, but they had never really swam other than on their own. Now we're telling them, you gotta swim on yourself, by yourself and carry someone with you. And uh, some of that uh, is a little bit too much for them. The job of a rescue swimmer does not end when he reaches survivors and safely hoists them to a helicopter. Both in the water and in the air, the swimmer must learn to treat both minor and major injuries. If you have an open fracture, you never want to elevate it unless it's been splinted, but once it's been splinted, you can elevate it. They're learning a basic EMT level of training with a little less equipment, but the, the knowledge or the expertise level is that of an EMT. They're learning how to deal with major traumatic injuries, major life-threatening injuries, and uh, we only have about 20 hours to train them prior to the examinations. In the water, rescue swimmer recruits are taught to analyze a survivor's injuries to make a proper choice for hoisting in a basket, a sling, or his own arms. In any 
ejection situation, you're going to suspect a back injury for the pilot just because he's basically sitting underneath a rocket. That does a tremendous amount of stress to your back, so you're always going to send a, you know, an ejection pilot up with a rescue litter. If somebody has to jump out of an airplane and pull a chute, then you just basically have to ask them if they're okay and if they have any back injuries or anything like that. And you have to just assess the situation as it comes. Once in the helicopter, the swimmer must remain alert to further analyze injuries and treat them as quickly as possible. Corman Centauri goes to great lengths to make injuries appear as realistic as possible. Training's only as realistic as, uh, as we can make it. It's a whole different story when you're actually putting the bandages on the body that's screaming because he's got actual injuries that you can see. It makes it a lot more realistic. You gotta suck it up. I mean, if you're tired or whatever, you gotta take care of the victim that crashed or, or whatever the circumstance may be. Our job primarily is to stop the bleeding, you know, splint if he needs, if he has a break to splint it keep anything from else from being damaged and um, just secure them, put them in a shock position and get them to some doctors as soon as possible. During week three of the Navy Rescue Swimmers four-week program, training moves from the pool to the ocean and the helicopter rotor wash is no longer fake. I'd kind of like to compare that to driver's ed. You see today's generation as a Nintendo generation, so to speak. Uh, they can have all the control time looking at the video screen, but until they go out and actually get behind the wheel of the car, they don't know what it's like. And until that rescue swimmer goes out to the helicopter and actually jumps from the helicopter, he doesn't know what that experience is like. In the open ocean, recruits practice every type of water entry. For the Navy, anytime we do a daytime operation and the, the conditions are good enough, we will allow the rescue swimmer to jump out. It's the fastest, most reliable means of getting the rescue swimmer out of the helicopter and into the ocean. When conditions degrade to such a point where you're worried about the safety of the rescue swimmer, or it becomes nighttime where the pilots can easily lose sight of the rescue swimmer, they'll put him down on the hoist so that they know exactly where he's at. For rescue swimmer recruits, their first jump from a real helicopter into a churning ocean is, to say the least, exhilarating. I was extremely excited. I was, I was hearing the helicopter and, and feeling the, the crewman behind me and, and looking at the other rescue swimmer that he had just jumped. And I'm, I'm waiting for my turn. And you jump, and then you're, you're in the salt water. It's completely different. You know, you're, you're more buoyant. And, you just float and you're just really excited to go up and do it again. You want to, you want to get up in the helicopter and, and jump as many times as possible. What would make me want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? <laughs> just to know that, that that other pilot can, can feel safe and secure, that he knows that somebody's coming after him. And um, just to be that person that he knows is, is on their way to get him is a really good feeling to me. To, to know that you know you're somebody savior. I love it. I love every every day, every minute that we do this. I can't wait to get out on the plane and do it for real. For rescue swimmers in both the Navy and Coast Guard, training does not stop when school ends. On this day at Elizabeth City, North Carolina. A veteran Coast Guard rescue team heads out over Cape Hatteras to hone its skills. Coast Guard 6001, Roger, understand 06 BOB, Parent Command, Air Station Elizabeth City. Destination is Oregon Inlet. Lieutenant Newbecker is flying the Coast Guard's premier $18 million helicopter, the HH-60, Jayhawk, equipped with state-of-the-art rescue and navigation equipment. This right now is our radar navigation picture that you can see. This is the uh, Pamlico Sound that you see on the radar right now. We're just uh, exiting the Alligator River. And we can switch it back and forth. This shows our uh, GPS to display. And the uh, counting down numbers you see here at the top, that's our uh, GPS uh, position and latitude and longitude. It shows our uh, uh, position and our speed, 120 knots over the ground right now. 
Capable of flying at speeds of 200 miles per hour, the Jayhawk is equipped with powerful engines, giving a pilot the confidence that he will be able to hold a hover in hurricane force winds. Another part of the rescue team, an HC-130 Hercules aircraft, circles overhead of the exercise site. HC-130s are frequently used to help locate victims and guide chopper pilots to their exact locations. The planes are also equipped with water pumps and medical supplies that can be dropped by parachute. Once at the practice site, a Coast Guard 41-foot utility boat waits below to help the helicopter rescue team accomplish its tasks. The show now focuses on swimmer Jeff Johnson. Uh, what we'll be doing today is um, uh, first we'll be doing the boat work with the basket, and after all that's done, uh, we'll probably be doing uh, a couple of free fall deployments. Uh, what we'll actually do is uh, send the uh, rescue Randy in first, uh, then we'll fly off, reposition, uh, then we'll deploy me into the water to, uh, to recover rescue Randy. Uh, I'm, I'm sure probably first thing we'll do is uh, I'll call for the basket. They'll send the basket down. I will put uh, Rescue Randy in the basket, uh, call for pickup. They'll pick up uh, Rescue Randy. Also, uh, uh, after that, they will send down uh, probably a bear hook and uh, pick me up and recover me. Uh, we'll drop the uh, Rescue Randy in the water again. After that, uh, maybe do a direct deployment, which is uh, a method we use uh, where I'll stay on the hook. And they'll drop me uh, directly on top of the survivor and I'll use one of the straps to put him in, and it's a quick recovery pickup. Pilots take direction from flight mechanic Will Nowotny, specially trained to hoist swimmers and victims to safety. Nowotnik talks his pilots through every action he observes below. Rescue swimmer and survivor are clear of the water, clear to move back and left. Thank you. The survivor are below the aircraft at this time. Clear to move back and left. Clear back. Rescue swimmer and survivor are outside the cabin door at this time. The exercise proceeds flawlessly, but on this day, the sun shines and the seas are calm. Rescue swimmer and survivor are coming inside the, the cabin at this time. That is usually not the case when real rescues are required. The week of September 13, 1999, was every rescue swimmer's worst nightmare. Hurricane Floyd was bearing down on eastern North Carolina. The Coast Guard station at Elizabeth City was being flooded with distress calls. Rescue teams literally had to triage the ships in trouble. Whatever vessel was in the greatest danger moved to the top of the list. Priority number one in the late morning on September 15th was a 600-foot merchant vessel, the Magpie. They had a, a steam pipe explode uh, while they were out running the hurricane, and it caused a severe third-degree burns over two crew, about 50% of two crew members' bodies, and uh, they uh, needed an urgent medevac. The Magpie reported its position 80 miles southeast of Wilmington, North Carolina. Rescue swimmer Shane Walker was assigned to the helicopter sent to rescue the two badly burned crewmen. During the process of lowering me down, I got entangled in some of the piping that was on board the vessel. But uh, I still ended up on my back on the deck uh, because I fell off the piping. And where the ship was coming up, there was some slack in the cable, and I just fell and hit the deck, which hurt pretty bad. But um, I knew I needed to go ahead and get up and get disconnected as quick as, quick as possible. A flight surgeon was also lowered to the deck, and the two rescuers were immediately taken to the injured men. I'd never seen anybody burn like that before. I'd seen burns, but nothing of a steam burn of a whole body. Their whole bodies were completely burned. Because the helicopter was running low on fuel, Walker and the flight surgeon had no time to waste. Um, I could hear the urgency in the pilot's voice saying, we've got to go. We almost got left on deck on the, on the ship because we almost ran out of, um, it was called bingo time, the time when they actually turn around and fly back to the station. After stabilizing the condition of the two men, Walker prepared them for the ride of their lives. Helicopter basket hoists in hurricane winds. 
The rescue swimmer, basically with help from the other crew, had to carry these uh, two gentlemen um, over 500 feet across a pitching rolling deck. They had to carry them up through narrow passageways and stairs across the pitching and rolling deck before we could even medevac them. The injured men of the Magpie were flown directly to a hospital. Both survived. feels really good to know that um, all the training we go through pays off. But this was to be just the start of a horrifying three days for Shane Walker and other rescue swimmers. Floods, sinking ships, and a floundering container vessel would make Hurricane Floyd one week to remember or forget. On the morning of September 17, 1999, Hurricane Floyd continued to rage. Coast Guard swimmer Shane Walker's rescue team received a distress call from a container ship, the Hogue Dyke. From the start, pilot Glenn Freeman was concerned. We got a phone call in the operations center uh, stating that there was a ship about 210 miles offshore that uh, had a crewman that had been injured by a falling container. And I took a look at the weather and realized that the eye of the hurricane was only 60 miles to our west. And I was thinking, you know, this is, this is not going to be a good flight. On every rescue mission, the aircraft commander, who is also the chief pilot, has the authority to say yes or no to a call for help. With wind speed increasing by the minute, Freeman had to consider the safety of his crew and the ability to perform a medevac rescue. He chose to go. Due to the severe injuries of the victim to be rescued, a flight surgeon was added to the crew. Once we actually got on the scene, I actually had to take a double take and look and see what I thought I saw. The bow was underwater and the stern was out of the water about 40 feet and the prop was actually spinning around and you could see the prop. I, I've never seen a 600 foot ship do these kinds of motions. Uh, typically that's most of the size of an aircraft carrier and now the objective here is to put a rescue swimmer onto that deck without slamming him into the ship or somehow putting him in the water or hurting him. Shane Walker was the rescue swimmer to be lowered onto the bucking ship came probably about uh, two inches from hitting the crane that was on the superstructure. And if I would have hit that or either hit the superstructure, I either would have broke my, broke my back, my neck, or something because I was moving very, very fast. Increasingly, he ended up in a pendulum swinging motion that actually brought him, I, I thought he actually touched the side of the ship. I couldn't tell, but uh, he, he said he had his feet out ready to fend off the side of the, uh, the superstructure. There was a jack staff, which was basically a flagpole on the stern, and we were real concerned about impaling him on that. I thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing this for? Trying to rescue somebody that I don't even know. I have a family. I have twin boys who I may never see again because I'm doing this. I was scared to death, and um, I called it off. I called the hoist off, and later, um, Un unbeknowing to me, the flight mech had called the hoist off at the same exact time that I had. He realized that, um, and realized that there was no way that I could be put on that deck. The rescue team decided to have the ship's crew secure the injured man to a basket lowered from the chopper. Then, flight mechanic Kenneth Lathley took over. They got the survivor into the litter, and when we, when we retrieved him from the vessel, uh, again, due to the strong winds and whatnot, there was a pendulum effect with him as well. And we stabilized it as well as we could and brought him up into the cabin. And the uh, rescue swimmer and flight surgeon attended to his injuries and uh, brought him back in to land and brought him straight to the hospital. The injured man survived thanks to the heroic efforts of the Coast Guard crew. The North Carolina coast was a sea of rooftops and treetops. Stranded survivors were already being hoisted out of harm's way by both Navy and Coast Guard helicopters. Rescue swimmer Shannon Scaff's first assignment was to check out a flooded barn. 
I basically got down to the water, crawled out of the basket, and started to wade. I believe it was like chest deep water to this barn. Walked in to find 16, 18, 20 people standing there looking at me with these wide-eyed deer in the headlights looks. Like, uh, you know, what do we do? So I took my helmet off. I introduced myself as a Coast Guard swimmer and uh, explained to them that uh, I was going to be walking them out one at a time and, uh, and putting them into a rescue basket. Wanted them to keep their arms and legs in the basket, assured them that everything was going to be OK, and uh, to just enjoy the ride, basically. The Coast Guard's Jayhawk helicopter is designed to carry six to eight crew and passengers. On this day, as many as 25 crowded in to be airlifted to safety. It came down to a point of like, well, there's rising water. There's about 15 people right here. If we only pick up uh, eight and then come back for the other ones, those other eight might not be here by the time we get back. So we're going to get them all. And we would just uh, continue to hoist them. And we just said, people, just move over. Your uh, wife's sitting on your lap and your daughter's sitting on her lap. And uh, we just stack people uh, three deep in that fashion. Flood rescues may appear relatively simple compared to those conducted in the ocean, but floodwaters have their own complications. As they're being lowered from their helicopters, rescue swimmers have to be concerned with unseen obstacles and live power lines. Swimmers also must deal with the emotions of survivors who have never faced such a crisis. Coast Guard rescue swimmer Sean Lansing experienced that situation firsthand when he was hoisted down to rescue a frantic truck driver. When I was lowered to that person, he was very anxious. You could see it right away. You have to coax a person. You have to convince them that, hey, I'm calm, look at me. This is no big deal. We can do this. I thought I was going to have a heart attack on the way up. He was very vocal. He was sort of just screaming. It wasn't like, it was just a guttural, ah, you know. Um, I think he was very scared, and I don't blame him. Following the last rescues involving Hurricane Floyd, rescue swimmer Sean Lansing had little doubt about why he's willing to perform such dangerous tasks. It's a really gratifying feeling to be able to pull someone out of harm's way, drop them off at a hospital and realize how serious the incident was. We do this so often, we, we sort of get numb to the extent of what we're doing. A lot of people see what I'm doing and they think it's incredible. After you do it for a while, it becomes routine and you forget just how incredible it all is. Every rescue swimmer at one time or another experiences a moment that literally defines what his job is all about. For Sean Lansing, that moment came not during a close brush with death, but when he was called to medevac an elderly woman with peritonitis off a cruise ship named the Rotterdam. We communicated with the cruise ship exactly what we needed done uh, to help us in the hoist. They cleared the forward deck area of all loose items. They're waiting for me, uh, hoist me down to the boat. Um, even though everything seemed relatively calm, when I approached the deck of the boat, all of a sudden I was laying prone on my back. And the next thing I knew, I was standing again. Sean was then taken to meet his survivor, Peggy Stevens. The doctor had said to me in the, in the uh, infirmary that there was always a certain amount of danger when they lifted somebody by helicopter. And I thought, it can't hurt any worse than it does now, even if they drop me. I really wasn't that worried about it. The next I knew, I was out on the deck in this six-foot wire basket covered with blankets watching this whirly bird upstairs, thinking, oh, any other day I could really enjoy this. <laughs> Within minutes, a ship nurse, Peggy Stevens, and Sean Lansing were on their way into the helicopter. Seeing the team of Coast Guard people in the helicopter and, and how many they were and how concerned they were 
and how they worked together, I really began to feel like maybe it was going to be okay. Peggy Stevens was flown directly to a hospital. Why would this relatively routine medevac remain lodged in Sean Lansing's memory? On the way back, we found out that she had actually ruptured about five minutes after we got there. So to be able to bring that lady to the hospital and find out that she would have most likely died had we not been able to get her there any sooner, that was really, really something. Not all Coast Guard rescues have happy endings. Coast Guard pilot Rick Bartlett's unforgettable moment was a mixture of pride and pain. In early November 1999, his rescue team was called to answer a distress call from the Carolina Breeze, a 75-foot fishing vessel taking on water in very rough seas, 40 miles east of Chesapeake Bay. Pretty good swing here. After lowering a pump to help the captain keep his ship afloat, five of seven crew members were hoisted to safety. We get all five of the people on board, and, and at that point, I know what the captain's probably thinking. He's looking at, he's weighing his various options here. He's looking at his several hundred thousand dollar vessel, and he's about 30 miles from Norfolk at this point, so he's got several hours of running to go, but the flooding's coming in faster and faster. So I inquire of him if he'd like to come off. Uh, captain, uh you, we got a proposition for you here. We feel bad about leaving you here right now. We, we'd love to take you off right now. We're going to have to leave due to low fuel. Uh, it's your decision ultimately, but uh, I'd, uh, I got no problem taking you both off right now, and uh, we can have you warm and dry in a matter of a few minutes. No, go ahead, Cap. I'm going to try to go down right now and try to get this other pump going and try to stay ahead. I want to try to save this boat come back. All right. Uh, we'll be back just as soon as we can, and we're going to Oceana, yes, sir, I'll be back out. Roger on that, Cap. You guys be safe going in. At that point, I fully expected that, worst case, I'd come back out in an hour or so, and I'd find the two of them there sitting in their life raft, having a smoke and waiting for us to hoist them up. But when Bartlett and his crew returned two hours later, neither the Carolina Breeze nor a life raft were to be seen. Soon, however, a figure in a survival suit was spotted in the water. Represent the basket, putting the survivor in the basket. It was not the captain, it was the, uh, the first mate, and we immediately went through our checklist, pulled into a hover, sent our rescue swimmer down, and we recovered uh, this man in good shape, not hypothermic, uh, well insulated by his, uh, his neoprene survival suit, probably what saved him from hypothermia. Searching guys, uh, Doug, when you can, try to get our man on the ICS so we can talk to him, find out what Roger happened. That. What happened to he thinks the captain went down with the boat. He said it went right down. Oh, boy. He said the guy was still in the boat. For Bartlett, finding the surviving first mate was a bittersweet moment and what could have been a happier ending. I wish I could say something that would force them to see, see it from my side and take advantage of, uh, of the rescue when it's available. Fortunately, most of the time, the mariners realize that the situation's bad and we're their only hope, and if they don't come with us, they may not have a second chance. Seldom are rescue swimmers rewarded in any way for their heroism. When a swimmer is recognized by his government, it is definitely for an incident worth remembering. For U.S. Navy swimmer David Allen, such an incident occurred in March 1995, when he was stationed on a supply ship in the Persian Gulf. An Indian commercial ship with 12 crewmen aboard was in danger of sinking in stormy seas. Allen's rescue team was the first to reach the scene. An attempt was made to lower him onto the ship but high winds and 15-foot swells made such a maneuver impossible. Allen's crew chief radioed to the sinking ship's captain that the crewmen would have to abandon ship one by one, and Allen would rescue them in the water. The water was very cold. It was startling. 
was not ready for it. We got caught on the top of a swell, and the swell pushed me right on top of the survivor, which was lucky for me, but he was very scared, panicky, and did not know who I was. So I had to turn him around, told him to relax, that we were going to get him out of here. Within seconds, the first survivor was hoisted to safety. But Alan stayed in the frigid water. I don't know where this next survivor is. Helicopter came in, picked me up, and did what we in the military call a short haul, which kept me on the cable. As I'm looking down, then I, I, I'm noticing how far the next survivor really was, approximately 400, 500 yards away, which I probably would not have found him. Lowered me into the water, hooked him up in the rescue strop, asked him if he was OK, the whole nine yards, as I'd done with the, the previous survivor. Signaled up hoist to the crew chief, and we both went up into the helo this time. As soon as I got up in the helo, I helped uh, the survivor in, uh, checked on the other survivor. And about that time, crew chief's tapping me on the shoulder, saying it's time to go again. Fortunately for Alan, two other Navy rescue helicopter teams arrived on the scene. Alan personally pulled two more survivors out of the water, while his colleagues took care of the remaining eight before the ship sank. For risking his life in the torturous freezing seawater, David Allen received the most prestigious award presented by the Navy during peacetime. I received the Navy Marine Corps Medal from the President of the United States because of heroism. When I received the medal, I felt elated. I thought that everyone in my squadron, and everyone that I worked with deserved it because we all trained together. But me being sick, singled out for someone to receive this award was was great. It, that, it's easy, easiest I can say. It, it was great. Every rescue swimmer can share a part of David Allen's medal. Though often unrecognized, their talents and courage have brought a whole new level of expertise to America's armed forces in a rare domain that serves both military personnel and civilians alike. For those in the civilian world, you have your policemen, you have your firemen, you have your paramedics. They belong to a special organized group. They understand that sense of teamwork, the sense of pride that develops in doing the job right and being capable of doing the job right. The old saying of living 23 hours of boredom, 15 minutes of sheer terror, that applies to the rescue swimmer as well. During peacetime, it is encouraging to know that some very critical efforts are being made by the military to serve both civilians and armed forces personnel. All rescue swimmers feel that their motto is much more than a catchphrase. So others may live. That really tells the story of the rescue swimmer. So others may live is not just something that is nice to say, it's actually why we do the business that we're in. We can trash a, a multi-million dollar jet, but you can't trash a pilot, you can't trash a human life. I'm here to risk my life to save somebody else. That's it, that's what I came in to do. We're in the military and the general job of the military is to preserve democracy, fight wars. And uh, luckily my part of that is, is to help save people too at the same time. A unique breed of Coast Guard and Navy men and women whose purpose is to save lives rather than take them away. America's rescue swimmers.